Hear now the word of God from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but he is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him in our dealing with you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Don't you realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong, not so that people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority. The authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends of Jesus, we live in a world that is often easily offended. And maybe some of you even kind of see what's coming and you're like, I'm offended by that. But whether it's political views or personality traits, decisions people have made, or just your new haircut, everyone has something that they're sensitive about and they get upset when somebody disagrees with them. And this sensitivity and readiness to take offense results in deep divisions across society and within communities. I mean, just look at what's happened in the last couple of years, and you can see this, right? Differences of opinion about presidential candidates, public health regulations, uh, sexual morality, the war in Gaza, and countless other issues that have broken apart friendships, strained family relationships, and that even find their way into the church. Over and over again, we hear laments about our inability to bridge gaps and the importance of simply embracing tolerance and difference in society. And so maybe it's a bit of a shock for us this morning as we think about this tolerant, diverse world in which we are encouraged to inhabit to hear the Apostle Paul concluding his letter to the Corinthians with a stern warning about the direction that the church is going. Now, over the last couple of weeks, in second, the end of 2 Corinthians, we've seen how Paul has defended himself and his ministry in the face of attacks from those who felt that he just wasn't showy or sophisticated enough. And there's something in us today that hears the response that he's offered over these chapters, and maybe in the back of our minds, we wonder why it's such a big deal. I mean, we know, after all, okay, this is the Apostle Paul, he must be doing it right, but still, let go of it, Paul. Is he just digging in his heels about his authority as an, an apostle and his expectation that the church needs to repent? Is he just being prickly? Is this just a situation where he needs to get a little bit of thicker skin? Some scholars today argue that Paul was just an arrogant, stubborn jerk who called his opponents' names and imposed his view on others. And so as we look at a chapter like this, we have to ask, is that really what's going on? Is this just Paul being angry and annoyed? Or is there something here that God's Spirit would have us learn about a holy response to division and opposition? So this morning, I want to look at two things that we find in this text. First of all, I want to look at the nature of offense. And then secondly, I want to look at the gospel hope. The first chapter, the part of the chapter is about holy offense. A few minutes ago in our time of confession, we heard, I think it was Emmeline who read the list of sins that, that Paul had offered uh, in chapter 12, verse 20. There's quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger. There are factions among you. 
Now, this is nothing new. If you read both letters to the Corinthians, Paul's been dealing with these issues since the very first part of the, letter, first, part of the first letter he wrote, 1 Corinthians 1. One of the first issues he's addressing, I hear there are divisions in the church. There are problems that need to be, be, be brought together here. But the differences of opinion about the nature of leadership in Corinth reflected some deeper problems of the heart that Paul goes on to name in chapter 12, verse 20. It's led to slander and gossip and arrogance and disorder. In other words, the Corinthians are finding plenty of ways to offend and to take offense. They've also offended Paul, and they've been offended by him. But most of what Paul sees as he's been dealing with the Corinthian church is not, shall we say, a holy offense. Instead, he sees them reacting to a, a, out of a sense of personal insecurity and concern over their public image instead of speaking in the power of Christ. Now, one of the things that we do see in this chapter, Paul has notes that there's lots of reasons that we can get upset in the Christian life. In particular, Paul is distressed by disunity he sees in the church as a result of the sins in, uh, in Corinth. And more than that, the kind of whole hum way the Corinthian church has responded to sin in their midst. He finds such disunity humiliating because it takes the focus off of Jesus. As people look around and say, well, what's different about the church? There's really nothing that separates us from, you know, them from the world around them. What's, what's unique about them? And as Paul tries to lay the groundwork for a future visit, he emphasizes in verse 2 that sin needs to be confronted. Now, he doesn't say that this is pleasant stuff. In fact, it's pretty clear by the time he gets to verse 10 that he doesn't really want to address sin. I mean, who really likes to try to confront, right? Is, does anybody like that? But there's a reason. There's a reason that the Bible and our confessions tell us that Christian discipline is a part of the Christian life. And that is because in many cases, we would rather not have the hard conversations about where God may be shaping or correcting us. And so it's easier to get angry and prickly or to withdraw or just to avoid conversations when others try to discuss things that we would rather not hear or to ignore our differences completely and pretend that there's really nothing that we're disagreeing on. What Paul is encouraging here is a unity that comes from being offended by the right things and letting go of the things that don't divide us from each other in Christ. The difference, as, as he said a few chapters earlier, is really a vision for the gospel. Are we talking about Jesus crucified? Are we confronting our sins and the sins of our heart that Jesus paid the price for? and that God's Spirit is then working to redeem us from. Now, it's one thing for us to see this problem in Corinth or in the wider world around us today to say, oh yeah, there's divisions out there, that's bad. Awful stuff, we need to deal with that. But if we're honest, that way of thinking creeps into the church as well. I thought of this a couple of weeks ago. I was in a coffee shop working on a, on a sermon, and in the background came the, the lyrics to or the, the Billy Joel song, uh, My Life. You know it. I'm dating myself a little bit here, but um, you can probably sing the lyrics, right? The chorus that goes in the background. I don't care what you say anymore. This is my life. Go ahead with your own life. Leave me alone. And there's a sense of independence and yearning for self-discovery in the song that runs deep in the American psyche. It was written at a time in the late 1970s when many people were trying to escape what they saw as sort of the, the narrow confines of societal norms. But there's something in that song that is fundamentally undermining the covenantal obligations God has given us to each other, given to each other in the church. Billy Joel's lyrics capture the offense that we take when someone tries to speak their mind. You can speak your mind, but not on my time. But in the church, we are called to speak our mind to each other. It's part of Christian love. To ask each other, what is God doing in your life through this? Where is God working? Is this really in line with what God would have you do and to be? And that's what Paul is trying to encourage here. And so we need other ways of resolving differences of opinion that don't default to either avoidance or immediate hostility. 
Paul's challenge to the church and to us today is to remind us that offense for the sake of the gospel, offense for the sake of Christ's holiness, is valid. And in fact, it's preferable to moral laxity or sort of a, a surface level of niceness that doesn't really get to our identity as forgiven sinners in Jesus. At the same time, he urges a greater willingness to let go of personal grievance about others' style and actions so that whatever offense we have is truly a holy offense rooted in the, in the concern for the things of God as evidenced by our own seeking after God's holiness. Now, maybe you say, all, hear all that this morning, you go, well, that sounds good, but that's really not very much fun to do in practice. And I agree. Because even in a church community like this, there's plenty of differences, right? I don't have to tell you that. Some of you here this morning think, love what President Biden is doing. You think he is doing an amazing job running this country. Others here think his policies are destructive and undermine the values of our nation. In this church, we have differences of opinion on many theological issues. Maybe it's things like the role of women and men in leadership or things like the vision for the end times and what the sequence of events will be leading up to Christ's return. Others of us have been hurt by another individual who challenged a decision that we made at some point. In response, some of us are frustrated by the way our loving advice has been disregarded. And we could keep on going with that list, Right? There are ways that we offend each other. There are ways that give offense. Some of them are even valid. But offense can never be our last word as believers. And so we want to take note this morning of the second thing that we find in this text, and that is the gospel power, the gospel hope that shapes the way we deal with holy offense in a community of believers. Now, in the closing verses of this letter, we find three sets of instructions about how to deal with situations of offense. And I want to just look briefly at each of these kind of three chunks of text here. First, there are some commands for those who are being offended. Paul urges the church community in verse 5 to examine yourselves and test yourselves. But there's a specific goal in mind in that in verse 5. Did you notice it there? He says, examine yourselves, test yourselves. Do you know that Christ Jesus is in you? See, no one really likes to have someone suggest that their way of looking at things is wrong, whether it's a political view or a theological conviction or their behavior. But one of our convictions in the church, isn't it, is that God uses his church, he uses this company of believers as a means of correcting and shaping and encouraging us. And so when somebody from the community of believers comes to us and says, you know, I, I have some concerns here we at least have a level of obligation to take those concerns seriously and try to engage them. But the bigger question we should be asking when somebody confronts us is not, am I right and they're wrong? Or maybe, are they wrong and I'm right? Did I say that the same way? It's not who's right and wrong, but rather, where is Jesus at work in this situation? Am I looking for Jesus and what he might be saying to me? Not so much, do we agree or can we find a way to come together on the same page here? But what about their offense is holy? And if I'm offended by their offense, what about my reaction is holy? And what maybe needs to be reexamined in light of the gospel? See, if others' offense sparks in us the kind of sinful responses that Paul listed earlier in chapter 12, verses 20 and 21, then there needs to be some kind of careful look at our relationship with Jesus. Paul says in verse 19 of chapter 12, he says, that's the approach I tried to take with you. I wasn't so much trying to argue with you, I was trying to explain to, to God what I'm doing and how I'm speaking to you. And now he urges the same approach in the church. Look to Jesus. If we're going to have disagreements, if we're going to have discussions about what's right and what's wrong, keep Jesus in view. And he invites us to see the same gospel hope that's in the question. What does my reaction say about what's important to me? 
When this person is speaking to me, and it kind of raises my ire because I don't feel very good, I'm uncomfortable with what they're confronting me on, what does my anger, what does my avoidance say about my priorities in life? And where Christ falls on that list of priorities, his holiness, his message of salvation. So that's to those who are offended or being offended. Now to those who may be called to give offense, Paul makes some observations to those as well, to those who confront. And in verses 7 and 8, he seeks to clarify his approach to the Corinthian church. He's praying for them, first of all. He's praying for them, and he's praying for them to do what is right so that God's people may be strengthened in the, in the truth. And he says a couple of verses later, so that you may be built up. Now notice what truth he's talking about here. This is not about my truth, but it's God's truth. It's not about getting things my way, Paul's way, but it's about getting a sense of where Jesus is at here. See, not everyone in the church, Paul says, needs to be on the same page politically or even necessarily theologically. I mean, we, we need a common theological core. That's, I'm not saying it doesn't matter what you believe. But Paul says the most important thing is that we have some common sense about the truths of Jesus Christ that need to be acknowledged, whatever our witness is, in whatever area of life we're talking about. Now, I originally picked this text a few weeks back when we had planned for having installation of new office bearers today, now that we had to bump that back a week. But, but I think the point still stands, and it's still a good time of the year to mention this, because it's leaders in the church more than anyone else who ends up doing confronting and challenging and, and trying to figure out how do we call people in our midst to see what we're doing together. And see, for church leaders, Paul says, the goal in life is not primarily the good behavior of people in the church. No, or after is people's growth. The growth of spiritual character, the growth of relationship with Jesus Christ that commands the respect and esteem of the wider world. And Paul is praying for their full restoration. Other translations put it perfection or completion. He's praying that they may be built up, that people can see that there's a work in progress. Maybe we can think about, you know, a stone wall that's been knocked over, right? I want that to be restored. I want it to be put back together, to be put in line so that it does its job. We want people in the church to, to be, be structured in such a way that together we are a beautiful witness of what Jesus has done for the world. So if you're the one confronting, Paul says the important element is that any offense is brought before God in prayer. And not just prayer that somebody else would see things my way and get in line, but prayer that God's gospel power, that his gospel hope would offer a growing, maturing relationship with God in Christ. And this isn't something that always gets done well. Sometimes even when we try to do it well, it doesn't get done well. And that's where, if you're the one being confronted, you need to hear the other side of that, what we just talked about a minute ago, to say what in their offense is really holy. What are they trying to get at? And where should that lead me to receive whatever sort of imperfect advice they are giving? Because this side of heaven, everything is somewhat imperfect. What would it mean for me to take that imperfect advice and have it lead me closer to Christ? So Paul gives some instructions for the offense, offended. He gives some instructions for the one who has to give offense. And third, Paul closes with a benediction that forms the basis of continued Christian community for everybody. The last sentence is the letter. The last three or four verses here, Paul is really just laying his final foundation. This is the last thing he's saying before he, he picks it up, picks up a relationship and says, I'm coming to see you. And what he says, in a set, essentially, is that the gospel hope gives us a couple of things. It gives us joy. It gives us reconciliation or restoration. It gives us encouragement. It gives us unity. And it gives us peace. Now, I, I read that list, and you're probably all saying to me, okay, yeah, I, I get it. Again, you know, when we're in the church, we should pursue cheerful cooperation. But is it really that easy? 
And I think if we recognize that there are divisions between people on any level, we can, we can see that simply telling us to get along and be nice is kind of simplistic and reductionistic. If I'm not going to, I'm not going to feel like getting along with you if we've been at odds with each other. But Paul emphasizes that there's a way of viewing each other as family. Having familial affection for each other. He, he calls us brothers, he calls the Corinthians brothers and sisters. He's been arguing with this church for 13 chapters. I mean, at least parts of 13 chapters. He says, by the way, you are still my brothers and sisters. And then he cultivates, urges them to cultivate this sense of affection for each other with a holy kiss in verse 12. Now, this is a cultural thing. I'm not saying that we all need to give each other a kiss on the cheek afterwards. But the question should be for us, how can we cultivate a similar kind of sense that God is putting us in family here? And families have to work through things sometimes. And maybe it's a, a holy hug. Or, or maybe it's a holy handshake. Maybe it's a holy invitation to come have dinner at my house. Maybe it's a, a holy suggestion that the two of us should sit down and we should have, we should have coffee together or, or we should go out for breakfast and we should just talk about where is God at work in our lives. And then Paul ends it all with a sense of shared purpose that comes from looking to the power of the triune God. Because it's in the story of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we find the center of our relationship with each other. There aren't too many places where all three names of the Trinitarian persons are mentioned in the same spot. This is one of them. And so you can see the weight of what Paul is saying here as he closes his letter with this, this reminder that this is the family that we are in. We are in the family of a triune God who is in, in unity with himself, in community with himself. No matter what our potential causes for offense, we are in community because God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has brought us together in grace and in love and in fellowship. And this gives us the ability to say, you know what? By God's grace, we haven't always done it right, but we see where we are growing. We see where our story is changing because Jesus' love and power are real. Because Jesus not only died, but he rose again. And it's that power and that hope that are at work in the church. The story of how God has dealt with our offense to him reshapes who we are in the times when we need to give and receive offense from each other. I read a while back about the story of Steve Ferrari. He's a founder and chairman of Men's Leadership Ministries, and he tells an, of an experience when he was in high school that helped him to see the power of offense, both good and bad. Steve says, you know, my family had moved to a new community between my freshman and sophomore year of high school, and I didn't know anyone there. And he said, I, I had planned that he was a pretty good basketball player. He says, I had planned that I was going to try out for the basketball team because I knew that that was a good place to, to make some connections. He was a pretty good basketball player. But he said, I kind of goofed off the first quarter, and I came home with a D on my report card, and I broke a fa that was a family rule. If you have anything lower than a C, Dad had said, then you have to concentrate on your academics, not on sports. So he said, I knew the rule, and I kind of resigned myself to not playing, but he was shooting hoops after, after PE class one day, and the varsity coach saw him and said, well, you're going to try out, aren't you? And Steve explained why he couldn't. And the coach said, but that's not how the school works. For the school, you can have one D, and you can still play. And he said, well, I know, but this is a family rule. And the coach said, well, let me call your dad. He said, well, you're not going to get very far, but you, okay. So the coach called dad, and, and dad predictably said, you know, I understand the school rules, but I have another responsibility. As a father, I have to teach my sons to be responsible, and if Steve wants to play ball, he knows what he has to do. So the next day, the coach came back to school, and he saw Steve in the hallway, and he told him about the conversation. And he ended the conversation by saying this, you know, I explained the school's rules, and your dad just didn't budge. I don't know that I have much respect for him. And Steve said, instantly in my mind, something snapped together. And he said, I knew well enough to know why my dad was doing what he was doing. And I knew he was doing the right thing. And if my coach was going to tell me that he didn't have respect for my father, then I didn't want to play for that coach. 
And he said, I never did. I got my grades up, but I knew that that was not going to be a healthy atmosphere that was going to raise my character. He said, my dad was capable of change. It wasn't that he was so inflexible that he couldn't hear and reason. But he was unwilling to change in this case because he had a long-term objective for my life that the coach did not. The coach wanted to win games. My dad, he wanted to build a son. In these last few weeks, we've seen the apostles struggle to do something like what Steve's dad was trying to do in that story. The Corinthians are looking at their church and they're saying, but Paul, there's plenty of ways that we can make this thing better here. There's lots of tactics that we could use to build a community. There's lots of things that we could be doing to gather a crowd. There's plenty of techniques that we could be using, Paul, to make an impression. And Paul says, I have a long-term goal in life. I have a long-term goal in mind for you as a church. I want to build you up as followers, as disciples of Jesus Christ. See, his struggles came because he had to wean the church from a misplaced assumption about what God's people should be valuing. They'd been offended by Paul's relentless focus on the message of the cross rather than the fulfillment of worldly goals. In their live and let live approach to doctrine and behavior, trying probably with best of intentions to win friends and to, to encourage people to come in, they've been willing to give allowances to unbiblical conduct. And then they found another reason to be offended by Paul when he called them on their behavior and said, that's not how we do it here. But Paul doesn't want to give up. He seeks continued relationship, and he urges the Corinthians to channel that offense into things that are holy, things that grieve the heart of God. And then he says, and that's not the last word, because there's a vision for hope here that comes from the gospel that changes hearts and reorients our lives in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul's prayer, he says in verse 10, is that we aim for perfection, for restoration, for maturity in Christ. And I would hope that all of us, whether leaders in this church or those who are members attending every week, that that's our prayer for ourselves and our church as well. That we would be a, a company of people who move on towards maturity and restoration and the perfection that Christ gives through his grace. And in a world where offense comes easily, our prayer is that God would make us a community with a kind of resilience that the apostle urges here. That in the face of division, we would be captured by, by the, captivated by the holiness of God that confronts sin, and also rooted firmly in the hope of his gospel that reshapes the hearts of sinners. As that power of Christ reshapes us, we will find that divine love and grace and fellowship are truly part of our community that others see the reign of Christ in our midst. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.